All right, class, we're going to be talking about Chapter 1, Art in the Stone Age. And uh, I want you to be reading the pages that correspond to the lectures. So you should have been reading the introduction already and now Chapter 1. Just want to point out that most of this book and our course covers prehistoric Europe and some of the Near East, but it's primarily about Western Europe and the areas that are considered part of the canon of Western art history. Um, so we do look at parts of the world that aren't in Western Europe. We're going to look at Mesopotamia, Egypt, Turkey, these areas in uh, the next couple chapters. But those are part of that canon, the lineage of the art history that we study um, when we take Western uh, beginning art history classes like this. So there are other courses available that are about other parts of the world that are non-Western um, types of art. So if you're interested in those, there are other types of courses, and we're developing some of those type of courses as well, just so you know. I want to talk to you next about some goals of the text and lecture from this chapter. We're going to look at the idea of understanding some of the origins of art in these in these time periods but it corresponds to like health human development and activity um, this kind of ties into origins of representation creativity and stylistic choices and then kind of role of human and animal figures in the art as well as some of the earliest techniques and materials that people use to make work and then um, the difference between uh, some of the art in the old Paleolithic Old Stone and Neolithic New Stone Ages, and then evaluating these types of work um, in context with each other. This is part of what your writing is about, doing comparing some of that stuff. So as you're reading and listening to the lecture, kind of think about some of these big ideas and take note of them. Um, and maybe I would even recommend looking at your um, writing assignment and looking at what kind of questions you need to answer there and so paying attention to those themes in the text and the lecture as well. This is something that your certain books that I've read a lot about in art history will ask these type of questions and say that art history in general really is very useful as is history to talk about universal questions about time and the nature of being a human, the human condition. Um, some kind of questions you might want to think about is who are we, uh, where do we come from, and where are we going? These are the type of questions that tie into a worldview, which is the scheme or conceptualization that people have about it's comprehensive about how they see reality. And we're going to talk a fair amount about this in different chapters because to understand the artwork, we have to look at what they think about what it means to be human, um, things like maybe the afterlife. So it gets into some sort of big question, philosophy of, of life type of stuff. Um, I think it's interesting material to cover, and I think this kind of comprehensive scheme for me is um, interesting to think about as a narrative, so like how the story goes of what they're saying a story about who they think they are as a nation or people group or people in general, um, what's the nature of being in their society, and then how do they have knowledge. And a lot of these cultures, especially early on, a lot of their work has to do with things like the afterlife and death as well, so we'll talk about those type of ideas um, in, in a lot of the text. This is a common theme as well. I want to take a moment to talk about dates and the way in which dates are used in this text and other books about history and art history. So there's different terminologies, nomenclatures, and I want to make sure you kind of understand how they go together. So you've probably heard of them before, BC and AD, and then BCE and CE. So BC stands for Before Christ, and AD is... Anno Domine, Year of Our Lord, and then BCE is Before the Common Era, and then CE being the Common Era. These are a newer um, addition, invention, and were kind of created because they're considered 
religiously neutral, but they're actually less historical as in they haven't been used for as long. So a lot of texts you'll see will use this terminology, these um, abbreviations. And then you'll see um, a couple other types of uh, common letters and things after dates that we'll talk about. But before that, I want to just say you can't use them together. So if you are going to talk about BC and AD, you need to use them paired in this way. You wouldn't say BCE and then AD and likewise. They need to be used in these pairs when you if you're going to use them. And then there's no zero. We don't have no a zero or lack of time. So BC counts down to what would be zero, but there isn't one. So BC1. And then after that, it's followed by AD1. So like a 40,000 BC is long, long ago, counting down to 1. And then 1 AD counts up to our present time. So I just want to make sure you know that. Probably obvious, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. And sometimes you'll see this little C with a period after certain dates in your book and different texts. That means circa which is basically saying approximately around about something of this time period. Um, it's because a lot of times they don't know the exact date, so they'll, they'll use this to say circa 1935, for example here, means built probably around 1935. But sometimes they'll have a really long period of time that they have a circa like 6,000 to 4,000 BC circa. Well, that's kind of a really, they're trying to shoot in the dark and hit a target that's 2,000 years. So they don't really know at that point, obviously. They're pretty unclear, but they know it's Neolithic, for example. What do we mean about when we say the term prehistory? And this ties into Paleolithic, Neolithic, Stone Age, Stone Age art, or prehistoric work. We'll see people talk about it, prehistoric work. What does that mean, prehistory? Well, one of the biggest things is it's time before the invention of writing. This is a slab of clay with cuneiform on it, which is one of the earliest forms of writing. And because there's no writing, we have objects and images are the main, in quotes, texts, so to speak. They're the historical link that we have to look at and sort of read and interpret them because there's a lack of written records. So it makes it challenging for us to do this reading and interpreting because we don't know as much about the people groups and what they thought. We're doing a lot of um, filling in archeological guesswork and kind of working out things like that. So you'll see in your text a lot of times there's a little bit of like, well, we think maybe this, but it hasn't been able to be confirmed. And that's why they're talking about that because we're dealing with prehistory. Another thing I want to talk a bit about is how this, this chapter, um, Stone Age art, is dealing with a really vast amount of time. Okay, These are approximations and people disagree about this of course as well, but Paleolithic meaning old stone going for a really long period of time. Um, you can see it there. And then we have Mesolithic, which means middle stone. It's a really long period of time as well. Not as long as Paleolithic, obviously, 2,000 years. But that's still a really long time. Um, 81 till now is only 2,020 years, right? So we're talking about a really long pe period of time. And then Neolithic being about 3,000 years as well. But it can be a bit different in different geographic locations. So an example is in northwestern Europe that the Neolithic lasts a little bit longer up to something like 1000 BC with Stonehenge. So it's dependent upon the way in which um, things like technological change with stone and bone tools getting into like metal tools and things like that. So that's part of why they can have different designations in different parts of the world. And we'll see this with some of the work 
the Neolithic period started earlier in um, the Near East, for example. I want to talk for a moment about a lot of the different type of objects we'll see and kind of their people having designations of time. Um, this is an interesting object that was, it's got a horse on it. It's from central France. It's up here at the top. That's the actual object. And this is an illustration to show you a close up of it. It's uh, as technology de developed, it replaced like stone and bone became, began to be replaced by metal. But this is a bone that has a function as a reshaper of stone tools, flint tools, but it also has decoration on it, aesthetic decoration on it. And it has a function. We think that the markings were a calendar of some sort. So it's very interesting that a lot of the objects we'll see will be aesthetic in some way and then have a function to them. Um, and another example of this is a bracelet that was found in Ukraine. Um, and they think that possibly it's an eight, it's an ancient lunar solar calendar. And so I show these type of things to talk to you a little bit about the fact that people and language had developed long ago and the ideas of language around time and language you know this is um, old stuff so not even though they don't have necessarily a writing system that we found there's still a complexity in the thinking to be able to develop this type of stuff and so we shouldn't think of these people as maybe stupid or that they don't have any sophistication just because they haven't they don't have writing and just because we don't understand as much about them so i think that would be a folly to do that um and i think that's a common sort of thing that happens okay i want to talk to you about a common prehistoric ritual burial practices we see a lot of all the way back from 50,000 bc um, we can see physical records that aren't fossilized from different regions have this ritual burial practice where they put red ochre, which is a pigment we'll be talking about, um, onto the bones. And, and it's possibly a symbol of blood and life. Practice that would have been pretty common would be them burying their dead with different types of aesthetic objects um jewelry or like the bracelet we just saw so that was a common thing another one of the practices was people being buried in a fetal position and they would often be oriented towards the rising sun so this gives us some idea of them believing in some sort of idea concept of the afterlife and possibly being reborn um especially because they're facing the rising sun, the re, the reborn sun every day coming up, as well as the fetal position being like in a womb. So this would answer some idea of a question about where we're going for them, um, which belief in the afterlife is pretty common even now. And throughout all, pretty much every time period we look at in this book, we'll see examples of people telling us through their work what they believe about that. So. And we'll see it on some of the objects we're going to look at in just a second. But before that, I also want to talk about how this era of society, the Paleolithic um, era, not so much in the Mesolithic era, the Neolithic changes a bit, and we'll talk more about that later, is a group of nomad. The groups of people are nomadic hunter-gatherers. So that means they get their food from hunting and gathering. They had communal living. And they probably lived in shelters like this, made out of um, things like bones and leather of animals, maybe mud, plant fibers, um, possibly tents and stone um, things, but also the mouths of caves. Okay. And they had fire, um, people say up to 600,000 years earlier, so they were able to make fire and have fire. And they used, like we talked about, symbolic markings on different types of surfaces like bone 
and bracelets and things they made. So they have a way of tracking time, and we don't know exactly how they did it, but like I said about the bracelet found in Ukraine, there's some idea that possibly lunar tracking of time because the, the moon changes over time. So there's quite a bit of sophistication of language to be able to do that. Um, and there's also in this time period, despite the fact that there isn't a written language, we do have uh, the so-called invention of recording the world around them in pictures and objects. So just because there's no language written doesn't mean they weren't thinking about capturing and recording some of the world around them and their ideas. And that's where a lot of these art objects end up coming into this conversation. So we're going to look at an object that was that is made out of a woolly mammoth tusk. It's made out of the ivory of a woolly mammoth. It's said to be sort of a human figure, not sure if it's male or female, with some sort of feline head. People have suggested a lion head. It's one of the oldest sculptures ever found. And it's very interesting going on to this idea of invention and sophistication. This is not something that the artist could copy from life. So it's an invented figure of showing the creativity of the artist. We're not sure exactly, as I said, we're in the era of no writing, what this figure would be, but there's a lot of conjecture about it being some sort of magician or maybe shaman, an intermediary of the spirit world, wearing possibly animal skins or a mask. Um, there's a little bit of debate about that. But we do have an idea that it's possibly from some sort of religious or mythological beliefs for them. And we're not sure, though, if it's mythological in the sense of, like, we get in Greek mythology, like a minotaur, which is a composite creature. Um, a man, you know, with a bull head, a bull and a man mixed together, like a bull head on a man. We're not sure if it's something like that. There's a lot of those type of creatures in different types of mythology. So it's not clear if that's what it is, or like I said, maybe someone in some sort of costume. It's about a foot tall, which is really large um, for this period of time. So it had to be very important to them. And it's estimated by people who do this type of stuff, estimating this with the type of tools that they would use to take 400 hours of labor, which is quite a lot, they would have had to cut the tusk off the animal and then shape it down to size, rub it with sandstone to get the big masses of shape. So we have like a big mass here, a big one here, this type of thing. These are the big masses. And then they would use um, knives, stone knives, flint knives to carve into the detail like the legs and things like this would be created with a burn, which is a tool they use to engrave. So pretty sophisticated stuff pretty interesting this would talk to us about those big questions of who they think they are and um, what they think of the world around them so we have a couple images that are categorized together as venus figurines and their original cultural use and meaning is a bit obscure but they've been suggested to serve like a ritual or a symbolic function. The name of Venus for these, there's a couple different ones. This is all the Venus of Willendorf. Um, has was given in the 19th century by the Marquis de Vibray. It's not a good name for it, and he just did it because he discovered an ivory figurine and named it after a Greek Hellenistic sculpture by Parax. Paraxelates. So it's just it's just a name that he gave to it because he thought, oh, they look like Greek Hellenistic sculptures of the goddess of Venus, um, the goddess Venus. So it's not really a great name, but they've it's stuck anyway because it's just been there so long. This is a pretty interesting little sculpture. It's in the round, so you can turn it every direction. But it's not very large. It's only about two inches tall, one to two inches, so somewhere in between. And it has quite a lot of detail. 
they say it's from about 25,000 to 21,000 BC, so a pretty big chunk of time there, 4,000 years, they're not sure. And you can see that it's um, got a large exaggerated breast, and the pubic triangle is definitely visible. And it's got a sort of feeling of monumentality to it, even though it's really small. It the figure looks down at itself. You can kind of, you can't see it this way. You can sort of looks down at itself. This figure view shows you that it has really spindly little arms on top of the breasts and very naturalistic knees that are kind of bending in right here. Um, most Paleolithic figures do not have faces, so this is a common thing. And the majority of them are um, female figurines. There are some male paintings we'll look at later but the majority are female it's been conjectured that this sort of stylized pattern on the head is either curly hair or maybe a woven hat but people disagree about that like you'll hear me say a lot in this chapter it's made out of limestone and could be held in the palm of your hand we believe the symbolism about it has to do with bre the breasts and the pubic triangle being so obvious. Something to do with fertility and possibly life and death because there's ochre, the red ochre was found on it. Some books um, would say something like a fertility goddess. These are pretty reputable sources I've read about this. Your book says no, that's not possible. Um, I would, wouldn't be, for me personally, based on my reading of different texts, I wouldn't put it outside of the realm of possibility as being that. Woman, women during this period of time would have had clothes. They would have worn clothes. So clothes would have been worn. So to depict this figure naked is a very specific choice. It's intentional. It's not as if they're just carving a portrait of somebody. And because of that red ochre, they've also talked quite a bit about the idea of childbirth um, being a part of this. And we could think that that might in some way be connected to the burial practice I'm talking to you about earlier with the fetal position like birth and afterlife. So if you think about the time period we're talking about way back in Paleolithic era, people's life was dependent upon herds of animals continuing to survive right um there isn't the local grocery store and so there's going to be a really concern about insecurity around the food source surviving um, especially when we're looking at an era when there's things like ice ages have happened okay so people have thought that there's a lot to do with the idea of fertility and the survival of the tribe being very 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 important a lot more important than maybe now because of the way the world is and so this would be you know a pretty likely conjecture that it has something to do with that um, especially since we've seen we see them in all different parts of the world this is another one made out of ceramic um, it's not in your book it's from Dolni Desto Nice A it's hard to say that word and it is 4.4 inches high and 1.7 inches at its widest point. It's actually made out of clay, a clay body that was fired at a relatively low temperature. So it makes it one of the oldest clay sculptures in the world. It follows the same kind of general uh, morphology of as the Venus of Willendorf, with the exceptionally large breasts, a large belly and hips, almost like maybe pregnancy relatively small head um, you know it's there's a common theme amongst these Venus figurines they have some common sort of stylistic conventions the next one we're going to look at is not in the round it would be what we would call a relief sculpture which means it's attached to its background um, there's different amounts of relief like I talked to you about in the last lecture between high middle low relief and then incised relief when it cuts down into it this piece it has two names in different texts 
It's sometimes called the Venus of LaSalle, and then it can also be called woman holding a bison horn from the same place. Okay, so you'll. See, I just want to point that out because a couple of different pieces we'll look at have, depending on where you read about them, they'll use a different name. It's not an exact name. This one, for example, always called Venus of Willendorf. This one, two different names. Okay, it has the same type of focus in it. This is what it's called in your book, Woman Holding a Bison Horn. It's figure 1.5. Um, pelvic area is definitely shown. The pubic triangle, exceptionally large breasts. Um, this is a bit different because instead of the arms that are like not here or on this one spindly and on the body, uh, the breasts, she's gesturing towards her stomach pelvic area. Um, the gesture has been debated quite a bit in meaning, as has the bison horn. I've read things where, and people often think when they first see it, the idea of like a horn of plenty. Um, this seems to probably be more of a modern addition or thought process. It's also limestone. It has been detached from its original, the place it was found in stone it was attached to. So it's in a museum right here in Bordeaux now and not attached to the giant block where it was actually found was a 140 foot cubic block. That's really, really large. And it was in front of a rock shelter that would be common for this era. It's about one and a half feet tall and it's incised or carved relief. So it's a sculpture in relief, like an image that has been carved into the rock. In addition to um, Venus forms, in Paleolithic time, we mostly see a lot of animals and a lot of horses, mammoths, antelopes, bison, and oxen carved. This is a cool piece that's called Bison Licking Its Flank. It's another piece that has a different name. It's also called Bison Licking an Insect Bite in certain texts. It's that carved piece on a piece of reindeer horn that was actually um, part of a spear thrower. So this is that common theme of function and aesthetic brought together. So it was functional object, a useful object as a spear thrower with an aesthetic part to it. And this is just a piece of that. It's pretty cool because it uses the shape of the horn really well. And people say, well, why did this artist put the the animal turning back and licking the flank or the bite right there? Because maybe the shape of the horn made it especially good to have the, the space compressed with the animal turning back. Okay, so that's one thought about it. The other thought is that at this period of time, in um, when we see in the paintings as well, they wanted to show the entirety of animals. A lot of times they'll show all four legs and even the head they'll show in a twisted or composite view so you can see like the horns and all of it. We'll see this in the last cow cave in different parts. We'll talk more about it, but there's a thought that maybe that's also why the artist did it. It's also in relief. And I really like this piece because I think it has a lot of beautiful little details for, you know, a small piece. It's from circa a really long era, so they're not exactly sure. But I like it, I guess, because I I buy the idea that it was an ingenious use of the shape of the antler horn, um, and that that's how it was already, and they used it really well by filling the space by having the animal licking its flank. So that's pretty cool. Um, they would have carved this onto the horn with a sharp point, like a burn. Um, similar to what I talked to you about with before with the um, lion-headed creature, lion-headed person that we were talking about with the burn being for the details. So they would have done that. We kind of see a lot of the detail, the horns, the eyes, the ears, nose, nostrils. So it's pretty detailed little piece for being four and a half inches long. 
Another relief sculpture beside this one we're going to talk about is also two bison in relief, but a lot higher relief. And it's inside of a cave. So this is a pretty cool piece that was discovered in France. And I'm going to show you a picture of it in place, in situ, on the edge of the cave wall. It's an old slide. It's hard to find new slides of some of these things. Um, and I have a collection of them from different teachers who have mentored me or helped me in the past. And they've given me some of their old slides of things you can't really find easily. This is an example of that. So it was made out of clay that was found in a different part of the cave. And it's ob like all the work we've talked about so far, the artists are unknown. We just, um, they didn't sign work. So this shows some naturalism in Paleolithic art that's pretty cool. They took the clay from walls of a nearby chamber in the same cave, and it's really quite a sublime piece. Um, it shows that same strict profile that we see in so many animal paintings and sculptures from this era. It was really a really strongly followed idea for a really long time, a convention to do them in profile. They're almost two feet long, so they're among the largest Paleolithic sculptures. And this kind of shows you the additive, subtractive part of clay and making something out of clay in relief. So they would build up the shape with the clay, um, and then they would use a spatula-like tool to smooth it out and get the big shapes. And then they would use smaller tools, like similar to maybe those burns, and their fingers to carve into the details of the nose and different parts of the hair and horns um, and probably they would do it with an implement but also by hand the cracks happened not long after it was made because unfired clay and so as clay dries it shrinks and it would have cracked so they're not because of how people found it and destroyed it or ruined it, it just is common to clay um, if it if it dries too quickly it could crack so they appeared as they as it dried. Pretty pretty amazing that it sur survived for so long, um, considering how old it is. And clay that's on fire is pretty fragile, so it's pretty amazing that it survived this long. The lecture is going to be about cave painting. So I'm going to finish up right here for part one with the sculptures we talked about. In the next lecture, we're going to look at some different sites of cave paintings um, that are pretty amazing and have a lot of detail and some really interesting different individual works as well as the actual caves and locations. So join me for part two of this chapter to talk about the cave paintings um, and then after that we'll talk about the Neolithic era which will be part three so you're going to want to watch all three parts of the video lecture here. Alright, take care and I'll talk to you guys soon.